This is the first of a series of videos about restoring the appearance of antique sewing machines. These videos will explore what can be accomplished with the simplest of tools and materials by someone with no previous restoration experience. Now, anyone who's watched Antiques Roadshow knows that you never want to touch an antiques finish because doing so can greatly reduce its value. Even cleaning the dirt off, what the artsy types refer to as patina, can have a negative effect. That doesn't really apply for the majority of the antique sewing machines available online, such as this 1888 Jones Swan Neck. The reason is that these machines were made to last, and they have. On any given day, there are hundreds of different types of antique sewing machines, each over a century old, for sale on eBay for as little as $200. They simply aren't rare. More importantly, most of them, like this one, with rusted metal, chipped paint, and worn artwork are in such poor condition that collectors aren't really interested in them. So, if you have such a machine, feel free to fix it up as much as you want without fear that you're ruining its value. Now, I'm not going to kid you. It's a lot of work restoring one of these to its original glory. But I have to say, it's fun. It's also very satisfying to bring something back to life that was built so well that it still works perfectly after 100 years. And with your help, it'll be good for another 100 years. So let's get started. The most effective and easiest way to brighten up any antique, such as this new home midget sewing machine from 1912, is to polish the metalwork. While some pieces have to be done by hand because of their shape, using an electric drill to spin some of the round pieces while you press sandpaper up against them really speeds things up. Let's show how to do it with one of these spool holders. My favorite tool is this electric drill mounted in a frame built out of scraps of plywood. But you don't need anything that's involved. A drill held in a vise just to give it some stability, or even a rechargeable electric drill with a flat bottom also for stability works just as well. Chuck the threaded end into the jaws, being careful not to over tighten. You don't want to crush the threads. Then, starting with a piece of 400 grit sandpaper, work it back and forth. Until it looks evenly shiny. Now, at this point, you may need to reevaluate. If you notice that there are a lot of deep pits, you may have to go down to 220 grit sandpaper and get those out. Otherwise, like in this case, it's looking pretty good. It just needs some uh, more work with the 400 and we'll be able to go on to finer grits to a better polish. Oh yeah, and don't forget, work the end too. Okay, after the 400 grit, I worked my way down through 600 grit, 1000, 1500, 2000, and finally 2500 grit sandpapers, all of which you can get from most automotive stores. This is a really good finish, almost optically pure. But if you want to go that extra mile and have something really gleaming, you can finish it off with a set of micro mesh sanding cloths. This is super fine stuff. I start with 4,000, 6,000, 8,000, and finish with 12,000 grit. When you're done with this, it'll be absolutely mirror perfect. It'll look like it was freshly chromed. And there you have it. Now I'm sorry I don't have a close-up lens available to show you just how bright this is, but it, it looks absolutely per perfect. So uh, another nice thing about uh, doing this amount of work to polish up your metal pieces is it not only makes it look good, it also helps preserve the metal because super smooth finishes like this 
uh, are very effective at deterring rust. The humidity uh, water vapor can't get at the surface as easily as if it's uh, uh, corroded or uh, scratched up with uh, sandpaper grits that aren't as fine as the micro mesh. So total time to polish this uh, little rod up five minutes and it was fun thanks to using an electric drill to spin it. If I had to do this by hand without the drill you're probably looking at uh, half an hour. Here's a little closer look so you can see just how shiny it is. It's looking pretty good. The same technique can be used to polish the heads of screws so instead of looking like this they look like this. That's a lot better. The trick to getting the groove polished out is to take a piece of sandpaper, fold it in half, and then run the folded edge through the slot several times. Again, working your way down through the grits to finer and finer levels to get it as polished as you're willing to do. This is a tensioning disc. Because the outsides are cupped, they tend to pick up dirt and they look really bad. You can use the spin technique to polish one of these by mounting it on a small bolt with a nut on the inside. Polishing both faces also improves the effectiveness of the tensioning mechanism because the inside plate, the part that rubs on the thread, will be mirror smooth and will allow you greater control and less abrasion of the thread as it passes through the tensioner. Here's what it looks like after polishing. That's a lot better. Knobs like this don't polish very well if you spin them and use sandpaper because the knurling makes it very difficult for the sandpaper to get inside the grooves to polish it up. The drill is still useful as a way to hold the knob because it's a small piece and hard to hold in your hands. What I find works very good at getting into the knurls is a Dremel tool or another uh, electric drill with a small wire brush on it. Now, these things are dangerous, uh, especially on a Dremel tool, because the wires break off and fly off at high velocity, and I have found them embedded in my clothes and my arms, my legs, so uh, you really have to be careful with these things. At the very least, wear a full face shield. That's a large shield that covers your full face, not just your eyes. Wear long sleeves and gloves. After you're done working with one of these, I highly recommend wiping down all the surfaces and carefully vacuuming the floor because these come off and they are needle sharp. But they do work well at getting into some tight spots. Once the knurls are polished up using this, then I will start to spin the the drill and use the sandpapers and uh, micro mesh to polish up the areas that aren't knurled. All right, let's take a closer look and see how she turned out. Wow, that turned out great. You know, when I started, it was so dirty, I didn't even know that it was brass. It only took about three minutes. Good investment in time. Another use for the drill is to hold on to these small pieces that are curly cues. These are called pigtails and are used as thread guides. With it secured in the jaws, you can thread a thin strip of sandpaper through the hole and moving it back and forth polish the inside. This is pretty important because like the thread tensioner discs, the thread runs through here and if the inside is rusted and rough, it can abrade the thread. In case you're wondering why they didn't make these things out of stainless steel so they wouldn't rust, it's because uh, the stainless steel didn't become into uh, major production until the 1920s, decades after most of these machines were made. If you want to, you can actually make these out of 14 gauge stainless steel. All you have to do is make sure that the wire you buy has been annealed so it bends easily. If this has already been bent into a shape, then these things are rock hard and really hard to, to bend into this tight a curve. If an antique sewing machine has a crown, it has to be its flywheel. Most are nickel plated to a high gleam and they look beautiful. 
The problem is, is because most of these have been used or abused for uh, over a hundred years, uh, these wheels become highly corroded. For example, this 1893 Bradbury was so heavily corroded and pitted that this looked absolutely brown. However, starting with 220 grit and working for almost 20 minutes, I was able to get all the pits out. Then, one grit at a time, working my way slowly through all of the grits, I was able to bring it to this mirror-like finish. It took me an hour, but I think it's well worth it. Some of the wheels you can't get off because they've been on so long that they're cold welded to the shaft. If that's the case, then you have two options if you want to spin these. One is to use the hand crank, which will go slower. The other is to make a little jig like this that fits into your electric drill. It's like the goal posts of a um, football game. Uh, what it does is this goes into the chuck of the drill and the two arms fit into the spokes and when the drill turns it rotates the wheel at a very high speed and makes this a, a much faster job. The only trick is you want to make sure that the axis of the drill is in line with the axis of the wheel. You do this all the way through the 12,000 micro mesh and you'll have a gleaming wheel that will be the envy of any collector. Here we are back with the Jones to point out one of the hardest and longest jobs you'll ever do on restoring the metalwork and that is polishing the needle plate. The reason these get so oxidized is that they're in constant use and constantly being touched by hands and the oils and the moisture from the hands makes this one of the areas that will get the worst corrosion. Because it can't be spun, you need to work this by hand and it's a long, slow process. Now, one thing you can do to speed things up is to use what's called a flap wheel on a Dremel tool. Uh, this has a number of flaps with um, grit on them and it spins and it will grind down the surface quite quickly. I can't recommend using one of these. They work great except they work too great. And the problem is, is if you accidentally move them back and forth like this, you can very quickly dig a groove into the surface that you can't polish out. So, unfortunately, I recommend using your hands and starting with, if it's heavily pitted, 220 grit, or if it's lightly pitted, 400 grit, and just sanding it slowly until all the pits are gone. One technique I like to use is to sand in one direction over the full surface until it looks clean and then reverse direction until all of the previous scratches from the sandpaper are gone. If that happens and I still don't see any pits, I know I've gotten rid of all of them. Then you have to do that for every grit all the way up through the 12,000. Oh, and by the way, if you use 12,000 grit micro mesh, you don't need to bother with polishing rouge, which some people like to do to give the final mirror look. That 12,000 is as good as the rouge will be. Let's get a little closer so you can see how effective this can be at brightening up the needle plate. Here's what the plate looks like, and you can see it's been cleaned off with a wire brush and a little bit of sanding, uh, but there's lots and lots of small pits. Here's what it can look like. Now this was 20 minutes work on this one metal piece, so an area this big is probably going to take about three hours. But remember that if you use this machine, this is the surface you're going to be looking at more than any other. So putting in some work to get it to be this mirror bright, I think is well worth it. I still have some work to do on this new home's little worker, but as you can see, she's coming along pretty good. Follow these guidelines and before long, your machine can look like new. Next up, let's see what we can do about cleaning and polishing uh, the paint on the machine's body. Until then, I hope you'll stop by my main website at waynesthisandthat.com. And as always, thank you for watching.